Welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. Today on The Microscopists, I'm talking to Florian Jug, research group leader and head of image analysis facility at the Human Technopole Milan. And we hear about his research using AI to better analyze and quantify biological data. Deep learning will, in, in, in general, machine learning and like statistical analysis will play a very important role. And I think, yeah, I, I can't wait. We discuss his passion for teaching courses across the globe. Uh, because I'm not in a university, so I don't have to do any teaching. And if you're not forced to do something, then maybe it becomes more attractive. I'm not sure. The whole endeavor is built on use, building useful things for people. And we chat about his early ambitions in computer science. I was already coding at home. And we were moving quite a lot, um, so there were always uh, uh, years where I didn't have a huge amount of friends yet. And that was great times to be friends with my computer. <laughs> All in this episode of The Microscopists. Hi, welcome to the Microscopy. I'm Peter O'Toole from the University of York, and today I'm joined by Florian Jug, who is head of image analysis facility at the Human Technopole in Milan. And Florian, I'm going to start head of an image analysis facility. Yes, that's correct. That's half my job. I'm also running a research group. We do more basic research in deep learning and machine learning on bioimage data and then there's also the facility part because i i think that's extraordinary to actually have an image analysis facility I, I if people have listened to this podcast in the past you'd have heard how image analysis is the next big thing and now we actually have florian who's actually has a facility for image analysis which i think is really uh forward looking i would say how did yeah, you that's a good that, that's a good thing when you, when a new institute starts uh, that you can kind of um, break with habits and do something new. And I was also very lucky that my ideas were received very positively. And I, I pitched it like this. It, it is nice to do basic science on new methods, but then bringing them to people is really hard. And in a facility, you can you can directly work with people that have problems which is also good and informative for the basic research side of things and then in order to make this all happen we have actually a middle guild which are research software engineers and they are very little spoken about and very hard to find and extremely important to have and so we we have a number of people that know how to build research build usable open source software and kind of they take what we do, but also what other groups do, and and give it as useful tools to our users. So I I I, I think it's a brilliant idea. Uh, I have a question: Who wants to work in an image analysis facility? What what type of individual is it that you're having in there? Um, I think there is. In almost every light microscopy facility is at least one or two people that are almost working in an image analysis facility, just that it's not officially instantiated. But there are always like some Fiji gurus or some other kind of processing inclined people that help the customers also to kind of deal with yeah, all kinds of data analysis issues. And we just yeah, instantiated it on paper. And we work very tight with the light imaging facility at Human Technopole. But yeah, I think the more complicated data gets, the more important it is that you have more dedicated time to really think about what is a good pipeline for a given problem. And so we have this time now. I, I, I think it's brilliant. I, and the reason I guess I was asking, you've got your research group. Okay. which I guess is researching into... Well, you tell us, what is your research group researching? Um, okay, at the moment, we do a lot of um, denoising and image restoration methods with machine learning. Um, we do a bit of segmentation, we do a bit of tracking, and, and that is... The image restoration part is successful enough that it occupies a lot of our 
minds, but I would not say that this is what I'm doing. So I might very well uh, uh, go into different directions. Also, at the human technical, um, it's not the most microscopy heavy community. There's lots of genetics and genomics and uh, structural biology. So that is microscopy heavy, but but much higher risk with uh, a lot of electron microscopy techniques. And so I'm very keen also in growing into this new community and maybe opening new new uh, research directions that are maybe even not image-based, but more sequence-based. Yeah, no, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think data's actually start, the data from these different technology aspects, like genomics, metabolomics, imaging, are increasingly coming together anyway. So I think the analysis side of that is going to become uh, really important uh, mm -hmm. and, and not easy, really. Conceptually, no, very easy, but practically yeah. really difficult. And there's a lot of, it's very easy to speak about it and it's very easy to see that it will be a thing, but it ain't quite a thing yet, right? So um, multimodal data analysis, it's really hard to, how to combine different modalities, mainly if it is imaging modalities and non-imaging modalities. And, but I think it will, the time will come. And deep learning will, in, in, in general, machine learning and like statistical analysis will play a very important role. And I think, yeah, I, I can't wait. So I mean, you're a, a relatively new, relatively young PI of a, for a research group. And you're, you're in a relatively new institute as well. Yes, yes. So how, how are you finding that? Well, you know, what, what excites you? What brought you to the human technical? Oh, many, many things. Um, first of all, I'm in a relationship with another scientist. So we have to deal with all the kind of real world problems of uh, waking up in the same uh, room and at the same time also finding a job that gives us the opportunity to do science on a really, you know, like professional uh, international level. Um, so we were lucky enough that uh, so Gaia is very successful on her own and uh, we were lucky to find a few things that also are uh, used quite a lot. So I think we made a great package and uh, the human technopole was looking for somebody taking care of the EM side of things and so Gaia was really good there and uh, after I pitched my ideas it turned out that they were also really interested in giving me a fantastic package actually unbelievable i would not have to write grants and could have a group of 10 people and wow yeah and and that's an opportunity that it's it sounded really good my wife is also italian so going back to italy and was a was a positive as well for us ah no i didn't know your wife was italian and a group a group of 10 is, is obviously a very big uh, a it's big space almost Almost too large. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I would not. My desire is to to stick to group size up to ten and or smaller, at least for now. I, I presume that means you can start really exploring very different areas of image analysis, or data analysis, not just image analysis, obviously. So, I guess that's a good thing. And as a group matures, you'll have that support under you. To it's, develop I mean, it's not a. It's not a research group of ten. It's, it's 10 over the three different sections that should not feel like three sections. We'd like to feel like a, a group of friends doing things together. But there is like the more basic science with PhD students and postdocs. And then there is the research of the engineering and the facility. So if, with a flat prior, it means like three, three and three plus me. And then each individual segment is you know not overly, overly large. But still, we can explore a lot of things. Because the PhD students don't have to worry about like coding things that people can use because there is people that do that. And, and the facility can really concentrate on taking the tools and also requesting the creation of useful modules that they can then use and bring to our customers. I, I like the way you demarcate into three distinct areas. And, and I know from my side the importance of that, but you also perceive that as being quite important that they have their 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 badges that they wear in the technical. Yeah, 
yeah, the badge is, is like the feeling of responsibility and ownership of what and purpose, right? Um, I really do not care if they sit segregated or, you know, it should really feel like a, a, a group of people that have their purpose and uh, together capable of doing more than they would be without the others. But I'd be guessing that if, uh, if someone wanted some image analysis support, mm -hmm. they know who they're going to and they have a, an expectation. Whereas if there isn't a solution, they go to the other group. And they would help. And it's a different endpoint expectation, different delivery time expectation, maybe. Yes. It's also a different, um, it's also a really different type of job. So in, in the research group, the idea is to pursue an academic career. So you want to publish well, you want to do something that is also uh, well perceived by the machine learning or computer vision community, which is not you have to jump through some hoops sometimes to publish papers. You have to also apply it to some real world data on faces or on, on street scenes to be reviewed favorably. And, uh, and the research software engineers, uh, sometimes people that have a PhD but don't want to be a PI, have an incredible skill set. And so they also look for a more stable job situation. So I am actually capable of offering uh, long-term positions. So and I the facility people are very similar. Also, also the, the people that really speak with our, with our biologists that, that receive new projects um, are also typically um, not at the age of a PhD student anymore. And, 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 and they seek some kind of amount of ability to settle into a, a longer term life situation. I think that's a really good point. I, I've met resistance uh, myself thinking about similar posts, uh, sort of around the data science side, that why would you stay in academia for that salary when you can go, because of the skill sets they have, they can easily go to industry, to their commercial markets, the money markets, banking markets, and make a lot of a lot more money than they can in science. But and yet it's it, my argument there is academics stay in the academic world, but they could go off similarly into industry and make more money. But it's I think it's a freedom, the the way that you have some not so you have some influence over where your work goes, even within the facility itself, you have some influence of how you bring users in. And you're doing primary, they're still helping primary research. They're still helping yeah. solve your cancers, your stem cell research, your ecological research. They're still having all those impacts, but with a, as a career. Yeah, this is really the, the, ideal, the ideal candidate really, really subscribe, um, buys into the mission of supporting the life sciences to do a better job, to be uh, uh, creating methods and tools and creating interactions and collaborations that help to make the most out of the available data. And uh, it's really hard, mainly in the research arm of things, where our, I would like to hire postdocs that could very well go to Google or Amazon or Facebook. And, and these jobs are not boring. There's very interesting problems to be solved and the starting, um, salary is most likely an integral multiple of what I can offer. And so I have zero postdocs at the moment uh, in the research side of things. Mm -hmm. And I would, if a, if a skilled postdoc that has a mission that says like, I would like to solve this problem in the life sciences, would come and pitch this idea. If I don't think it's a flawed idea, I would give 100% freedom. And still it's very hard to find people because there's so, so much need for, for good machine learner, for good deep learner, for this kind of skill set at the moment, because it's such a hyped topic. I, I was gonna say, be patient, because you know they exist, well, you exist, and you've come through that route, you know, it's, right. it's, it's there. So I'm gonna take you back, actually. Okay, I'm gonna take you back to childhood times. Uh -huh. uh, when you were young, 10, 12, what did you want to be career-wise? Um, I was 
not decided, but I knew that uh, computer science is absolutely amazing. I was already coding at home and we were moving quite a lot. Um, so there were always uh, years where I didn't have a huge amount of friends yet. And that was great times to be friends with my computer. <laughs> it sounds so sad, but it was really a good time. I didn't regret it. But, um, and then it kind of was interleaved with times where I did have lots of friends and where I went out a lot and where I was not a pure nerd. Sorry, yeah, playing. Um, um, so that I will end up what I do now was not planned very, from very early. So, so when did you realize, so you're into your coding, uh, my, my son's a computer scientist with maths and I, I, who knows where he'll end up, uh, he's, he's getting there now, I think he knows where he wants to go, <clears throat> but your first, what was your degree in, is that computer science? Uh, I, studied, I studied computer science and I have a minor in logic and philosophy of science. And that was in Munich, is that correct? Yes. And then, and then you went on to... Ah, I've got to get this right now. Is it informatics and management? I've done my research. And, no, I, uh, from Munich, I went um, to Zurich and I was joining a group that does a lot of discrete mathematics um, and extreme properties of random graphs. Don't ask what it is. I mean, I could explain it, but you wouldn't want to know. Uh, <laughs> but in this group, I started doing computational neuroscience in collaboration with the Institute for Neuroinformatics in Zurich. And that was, uh, that was exactly what I wanted to do. And I was kind of the, the scientific hobby of my, of my doctor mother, of my supervisor. Um, but with collaborators at the Institute for Neuroinformatics, I had really, really um, good partners to learn and think a lot about how neural networks, how small computing devices that by themselves are very limited in their capabilities in a network can become uh, so capable. And I, I loved every day of my more than five year PhD. But after five years, I looked back and asked myself, how much did I really learn about our brains? And it was so little that I expected that it would have to be like 700 years to make a real dent. <laughs> and then I, I switched. Oh, they are complicated beasts, aren't they, as brains? You've been in Germany, Switzerland, now in Italy. But I also know you, so, well, actually, at the moment, you're, where, God, where are you at the moment? Oh, at the moment, I'm in, in Woodsall uh, at the MPL because we, it's the, actually the last day of a two-week deep learning course we're teaching for microscopists. Um, to, yeah, to help them kind of understand this new technology and how to maybe use them on their own in the future to help their own analysis. Yeah, and, and you have a T-shirt to go with it. So go, show, go Oh yeah, but this T-shirt. This T-shirt is actually uh, you can see here. It's uh, and then on the back. Ah. We have the back focal plane. And um, that is not from this course. This is from a microscopy course where I'm uh, in the lucky position to also teach every spring in Cold Spring Harbor. And we acquired this on a, on a scope that we built with the students. Wow, so wait, so wait a minute. So you're, you're in Woods Hole now, you go to Cold Spring Harbor. I know you do the EMBL course well, because uh, Laura Wiggins, my PhD student who uh, with me came to what, met you right at the start of her PhD. It's a lot. Why do you do so much teaching? Uh, because I'm not in a university, so I don't have to do any teaching. And if you're not forced to do something, then maybe it becomes more attractive. I'm not sure. No, I actually, I do a lot of teaching because it is really a lot of fun. And uh, the whole endeavor is built on use, building useful things for people. And how would I know what is useful for people if I would not speak with people? And this is a good way to, to get this, to understand what are open problems, what do people struggle with. But at the same time, it's, it's also just a huge amount of fun to, to teach in places where really motivated students go, where you have you know this like can-do spirit, the unbroken young love for science. It's amazing. I love it. 
Yeah, I, I think think you're right. Actually, if you think about undergraduate lecturing, uh, yeah, they choose a course, but they don't necessarily think that each module is perfect for them. So they're not all 100% engaged. Whereas the courses you're running, people are volunteering or even paying to go on because they want to learn that speciality. So so it is, and and ultimately, I I know from Laura when she came back, they're inspirational for the students. Uh, it enables them to step up. So, so watch out for her work. Uh, also in segmentation and tracking, uh, but something yes. different is missing at the moment. So, looking uh, forward. I was a student actually at MBL in 2015 for the physiology course, which is a seven-week course. And you start at nine in the morning, and you know you have downtimes. It's, it's it's but seven weeks is a long time, and you get to know the other people really well. And um, it, it was yeah, it was transformative. Uh, courses in, in like Kursping Harbor or here in Woods Hole, uh, yeah, you, you cannot be the same after the course. You will be different. No, no so actually I did an uh, EMBL course, EMBO course at EMBL back in 2001, and that was very much career inspiring with Timo Zimmerman. And actually, I think Ricardo Henriquez was at that yeah. course as well as a student. Uh, so I, I don't mm -hmm. think I, he was in different, a different group, but I think we were at the same course together which we hadn't realized at the time yeah ricardo runs actually an embo course next month in portugal and i will also be be there for it right uh, it's it, it, uh, yeah they, they, they're just brilliant and thank you for actually running them so there we have it that's where you started that's where you got to where do you see yourself heading um okay i'm the first time in a situation where i actually could stay physically in Milano for many years to come. If that will happen or not, God knows. Um, the whole um, facility plus basic research thing is, is a bit of an experiment. There's very few. I don't know if anybody else that has a similar setup. Um, I hope that this uh, will prove to be extremely productive and fruitful. And then... And then that might be something that is enjoyable for a long time. Or I grow out of it and would like to maybe make it help other people to do similar things and, and help help the community to instantiate more this model more often in different places. I'm not sure. So you never um, attempted into industry? Oh, it was attempting many times. But then I think I got protected from jumping into a better paid job the opportunity to actually have weekends by being married to a biologist. Uh, you, you're telling me you get weekends? No, I would have gotten weekends if I would have jumped into industry, in the uh, industry okay. job. Right? But so, I do have weekends. It's just, there's always more to do, right? And I have a bit of an addictive personality and I really like what I'm doing and I like to do it well. And so science can be a very time-filling hobby. So and yeah, job. good term to use, uh, a, a job-fulfilling hobby. Uh, you know, so it shouldn't feel like work, you know. Sometimes it does because there's always the... The stuff you have to do alongside it so it's good to hear you know yes you might do it at the weekend you might intrude it's not intruding because it's what you like to do so thinking of hobbies what other hobbies do you have besides science uh, i run a lot i like running a lot uh, um, what's the uh, uh, what distance would you like me to run <laughs> <laughs> oh, go, go on let what's your typical training week and what's what's your biggest events um, it, it really depends. At the moment, I run maybe between 50 and 80 kilometers a week. Um, that, there is times where I run less, but there is certainly also times where I run much more. And my goals are anywhere between a fast 10K, which is actually really painful to train for, or a very slow and relaxed 24-hour race, oh. or 100, 100K race. Yeah. Okay, so so I, I, I see there now. You're at, I am very similar. <laughs> my latest, oh, yeah? my latest medal just there is a is a twenty four hour run. 
amazing. Yeah, I did only one, but it was actually really a lot of fun. Also, the preparation is, is really interesting because you have to really get to know yourself and ask yourself, what might I crave? What might I be able to digest and want yeah. to eat and not vomit? <laughs> Uh, or have other problems which which I encountered actually. How far did you cover in the 24 hours? Uh, too little to be proud of. 140 something. 141 or so kilometers. So maybe maybe you should come over and we should do this one, which is just down the road, for, not far from here. Uh, our target was 100 miles. Yeah, so, I, I, of course, I also wanted to do 100 miles, but I, I kicked the stone really hard in the first marathon. And then the second marathon, I thought it's, it's, I just kicked the stone. But I think I, I, I compensated for the ankle that hurt a bit. And then just everything fell apart. It was very painful at the end. And then in the, in the night, it started raining and everything. Everybody went to bed. And then, and then I, I was not strong enough to stay awake. So I went to bed for like two and a no! half hours. Oh, yeah, no. it's, it's a shame. Oh, no. But I, you know, the hip started hurting, the knee started hurting, and, and everybody was at bed. And then there was the rain. And it, uh, in one loop, I, I didn't take the right turn that I took like 40 times before. And I went straight on for half a mile. I was like, uh, I go to bed. Probably, but then I regretted it to, very much. Yeah, you and, have and, to and do another because... Yeah, I have to do another. It's true. For our 24, we, we never... We didn't stop. We, 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 we grabbed some food and drink, but it was lap after lap. And I don't think once uh, between me and my running partner, we running together, so it's solo. Not once did it cross our minds that we were going to stop. Uh, my friend Head. unfortunately got really injured very oh. near the end. And wow, he pained it through for the last yeah. lap and a half. We, we, lap and a half is still seven and a half. So it's, it's still 12, 13K. And... It was slow going, but we got there. We and we ticked the hundred miles within the twenty four hours. It was a uh... congratulations. Yeah, I'm a bit. Yeah, I'm, it is. It is nagging that I didn't do the hundred miles, and I certainly. And I think I was in shape to do it um, next year. Yeah, I, maybe. I, I, it my wife will kill me if I did it, but try. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how Gaia would react. I think it's okay. I think she understands. Uh, yeah. And it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. I also trained this, this spring for a really nice race in, 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 in Toscany, 105, but, but 10,000 feet of climbing. And I got Corona two weeks before it. Ah, so you didn't run it. Horrible. You didn't I run could, it. Yeah, I, I couldn't. Yeah, yeah cause, cause it does take it. It's, yeah, it's not. I, I ran on Corona, but short distances only. Um, yeah, I, I was lying in bed for like 10 days and it was two days after and it's not the best tapering to not do anything. Right. Yeah, I, I didn't do it. I was also anxious. I, did, I didn't know how I would react and, and then I I would be too headstrong to stop even if I would feel something and I, I was not sure if this is a good idea. So I didn't do it. But I'm in great shape now. <laughs> Which is good. It's the only <laughs> consolation. I was meant to do the 24 hour run last year. But I broke my ankle the Monday before it. Oh, my God. <laughs> so all that training. And it's insane training, isn't it? It's, it's so much discipline all out the window like that. But we were back. Anyway, moving on. What other hobbies do you have? Uh, I, I really like to do pottery. And I mean, hobbies for us, they really come in phases. At the moment, it's a pottery high. And then there's photography, which is at the moment at the almost all-time low. So um, you have a picture, I think, of your pottery. So oh yeah, I do. To, to um, flash that on your 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 background for us and tell it, because surely this is your photography and your pottery together. If you took the picture, yeah, I took the picture, but yeah, with an iPhone. But I I do like taking taking pictures, and it is a really beautiful way to kind of share your way of seeing things. So let me see the background and effects, and then here we go. Ah, oh, oh, do you know what? it really does? Honestly, I can now see it in large. It looks like a naan bread. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it, it is I like this, this doing these things because you, you want to control the shape of the object very precisely, and then you glaze it and you 
put it in a wood firing kiln where you have very little control of how the texture would evolve and how it will get out. So you kind of combine your uh, unreasonable desire to control the world around you with the willingness to give your precious piece into a very uncontrollable uh, final process, process. And we fired the kiln ourselves, which was the first. So we were oh. like, uh, it was, it's a five-day process. There's like more than two days of of stoking the kiln, which is the oven. Um, this is also why people say I'm stoked because you're kind of fired up. I mm -hmm. learned. And uh, it's 1300 degrees Celsius, which is a huge uh, temperature to reach only with burning wood. So, yeah, it's amazing. And is that a, do you have your own kiln if you stoked it yourself, or is it somewhere else you did it? We do have a kiln, but it's an electric kiln that we can, it's more than an electric kiln for at home. And oh. this uh, wood firing kiln, yeah, they're beasts. I mean, you need a big garden, but I, I, we have this plan. We are currently in the process of kind of buying a house and it, it would come with a, enough garden that we could probably put a kiln in there and disguise it as a pizza oven, which is much more uh, tolerated in Italy than having a kiln <laughs> in I, the I, garden. You've probably beaten me to it because I was thinking if I had a kiln like that, when I finish with it, I'm throwing, I'm throwing my pizza in it because that would be, what, one minute from start to end and that would be... I guess it would be a minute from start to not existing anymore. It's it's yeah, brutal. It's so hard. 1300 degrees is brutal. You open the the stoking hole where you throw the the wood in, and it's you are like a meter fifty away, and it's like the devil is licking your face. It's it's so strong. You have no notion of it. It's incredible. Wow. So how long have you been doing pottery for? I started during my PhD in Zurich before I went to Dresden. So it's a long-term hobby then. It's not, it's, yeah, it's it's not, you say it goes in waves and cyclic, but this is quite a long cycle. Yeah, 12 years. We are in maybe cycle four. <laughs> so does that mean you've gone out of pottery and back into pottery over that time? Yeah, 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 absolutely. What got you into it? Um, there was a sign next to the street that said pottery lesson. And Gaia said, pottery lessons. And then I thought, oh, she responds well to pottery lessons. That might be a good present for her. And so I gave her, yeah, we went to these pottery lessons for a long time. Actually, it was, if I say pottery lessons, you imagine 20 people following a teacher's voice. It was a, a really, a really capable potter. And she would open her studio for a bunch of scientists. And it was, it was delightful to be there with like, there was a professor for neuroscience and, and a few postdocs and a few PhD students. We were usually like maybe seven people. And, and the artist was an amazing personality and very capable, but the thing she was certainly not was a teacher. So we, we could just do what we wanted. And only when we did something that, that she found offensive, I guess, she would say like, why don't you try to do this? It was very, it was very nice. So it's good networking as well. Yeah. So, so again, very useful. Yeah. I'm going to bring you back into science for a bit. We'll come back out in a moment. So obviously you're into denoising images. Uh, you've done quite a lot into Fiji and different plugins. I usually ask a guest, what's their favourite publication? I'm going to ask you in your case, what is your favourite bit of software that you've let, yeah, opened up to the community do you have a favorite yes i think so um i think noise to void um one of the denoising tools I, I really like it I, I think the idea is very elegant and very simple um and it's extremely useful i, I really get a lot of kick out of doing things that are, are beautiful from a computer science and computational standpoint but it's really a different level if it is also useful and people start using it. And I think most of is used quite a lot. And how long did it take to develop that? It was not so dramatic. Um, I mean, we still develop it in some sense. 
it, yeah, it had a whole like slur of like you know versions and but from the the idea was brought to me by a postdoc at the time alexander Kohl. um he he looked at the care work which came before that did image restoration and he was like but we don't need ground truth we can do that self we can just take a body of noisy data and and figure out how to how to denoise it if the noise is pixel independent with short noise and voice or so short noise and, and gaussian noise and without noise is and from the moment where i said nah are you sure to the moment where we published was maybe five months wow that's really and, fun yeah so Okay, so if that's five months for your favorite bit from start to end, you sort of mentioned sometimes it's the simple ideas. What's the longest project you've worked on that you thought would be really good, but actually maybe maybe you haven't actually got to the end yet, uh, uh, to a point that you can actually publish it in some way? Uh, my PhD thesis, certainly, but that is a different topic. Uh, and in the, in the bioimage analysis arena, in, as a postdoc, I worked a lot on tracking. And uh, I know the, the field and the problems very well. And I think we have wonderful solutions worked out. And then we never, and then care happened. So Martin Weigert at the time had this wonderful idea of like, using units to do image restoration. And, and it was immediately clear that this is so obvious. Somebody will do it soon, but why not doing it quick? ourselves and it lifted off much crazier than we ever expected um and from that time on image restoration was a huge um time sink i wanted to say but of course it, it, it was a beautiful thing as well right but but a lot of, of the group the young group it was the idea was born just before i opened the group so i was still doing it in gene myers's lab Mm -hmm. uh, together with Martin and Uwe Schmidt and a thousand other people that gave us data. Um, and that kind of pushed the tracking away. And only now I have a first student again and we want to look into, into tracking a bit more. <coughs> and I'm actually excited that it comes back, but, but it's here, right? It's like five years or something. Right? I, I think it's just fascinating. I think uh, if, any, if any PhDs or lay audience are listening, that sometimes some, you have a great idea, but it can be really hard work to get to the end. And then suddenly accounts can come in so simply and get to get to fruition really fast. It, it's just yeah. science is it's just an almost, you can't predict how long something can take in science. It's really complicated. You know these machines where you, where, you, where you throw quarters or whatever country you're in, coins in and they fall on this like uh, um, platform and there's a small thing that kind of shifts them in front and then they are like at the, at the edge and they are like yeah. it cannot be more than one coin until it falls right it's like it's there come on give me one coin give me a coin and you try and they fit more and more coins and it just doesn't fall off and i think science is a bit like that because noise to void would not have happened in in this short period of time if there was if it was not built on top of a lot of thoughts and thinking and coins that did not fall off the edge right i love that analogy because as you say sometimes you put your coin in and nothing comes out but you keep going so you can see the big prize and sometimes you put coins in and you'll get one coin back or maybe you'll get a few coins back <clears throat> and you think no i'm not stopping yet i'm going to keep yeah. putting because i can see the big prize that i think and that's a really useful analogy because there comes a point if you keep waiting for the big prize that sometimes never comes that data never gets shared that work, that research never gets shared. So there's a point where you have to publish, uh, release the work. Uh, and as you say, what you've done with uh, some of the denoise and stuff is you then keep on iterating and polishing it. You don't wait for the, the perfect solution because ultimately the perfect, I guess in your case, especially the perfect solution is honed by the people who pick up your software and use it and feedback. Yep, I fully so, agree. Science is such a weird thing, right? It's it's kind of it's a search algorithm. We search for things that were unknown before and unknown now. Or in 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 my metier, it's also finding things that enable looking at data in different ways or kind of make 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 your life easier to discover things hidden in microscopy data or hidden in data in general. And it's so weirdly implemented on on a social 
community. And it's, it pays off to be persistent and bang your head against the problem, even if it resists at first. But there is also problems that will resist forever. And I think it's a really delicate balance. Do you go on or, or do you kind of realize that it will not happen? <clears throat> and if you, if you do that too fast, then you will never penetrate very deep because you will kind of try, try, try. And, and usually it's, not, it's never super easy. Right? So you need to persist. It, we would call it branch and bound in computer science. Right? You branch into different ideas and then you bound the ones that are hopeless. But what is hopeless, right? The, the solution might be just one thought away. So, uh, and then there's the importance of having multiple branches and, and not just I think so. one route, because as you say, some things don't work. So one of the reasons that so much of your work has been so widely adopted is a lot of it is freeware. You know, you, you put it out open, uh, yeah, yeah. open access to what you're developing. Why did you choose that route? over binding it up and selling it onto one of the big companies as a, a commercial product? Um, it's, uh, that's a really good question. Okay, there's so many thoughts. In my, how do I linear, linearize that out in one stream of thoughts? It's the only way to, to be really reactive. Uh, open source software can be messy and disgusting. But at least it is adapting fast to to whatever needs to be done. Right? Fiji is the most wonderful shitty piece of software, <laughs> is what I often say. It's there is a thing for everything. And if 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 we would have a new tool or a new data modality, if a new microscope comes along, there will be a plugin that does something meaningful with it relatively soon. Somebody will do it. Oh. Do you hear the tower? Only, okay. only vaguely. Or the, 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 okay, okay. So, yeah, your your headphones are also denoising your background. <laughs> okay, that's very good. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you want to react fast to what is needed in science because science, by definition, should be dynamic. Um, and, and the people that contribute, are, you know, they don't know each other. They have a different coding style, and so everything becomes a patchwork of, of. It's not clean, right? And if you accumulate in Fiji, it's not the youngest of softwares or in ImageJ. Um, if you accumulate this many things, you have something wonderful, but also wonderfully diverse. And while diversity can be beautiful, in software development terms, it is really, really not. <laughs> it makes everything hard. And, and then also funding. It's not common today to get money from our funding agencies to keep software alive. And in Germany, we slowly start, and I have no idea why I say we, I guess because I was there for the last 10 years. Um, the, the DFG now starts funding software maintenance, but that's really, that's really, really uncommon. And I think we have to do that more in the future. Because we, we science is not anymore like, you know, you look through a, a cheap lens and, and and observe something not new. You have to dig deeper. And if you dig deeper, everything becomes a bit more complicated. And I think the data analysis, we need some tools that kind of go with us and grow with us. And they cannot grow with us if you cannot maintain the basis of them. And our OS has changed. And, and you know, there's new versions of, uh, of, of, of Windows and Mac OS. And everything falls apart because it's this like bubble that we create as humans. It depends on each other and it's, it's, it's disgusting in many ways. And so it, without this funding, it will be very hard to keep digging deeper and deeper efficiently. I, I don't want to get too technical, but yes. if, if, <laughs> if you could start ImageJ Fiji today, would you use the same coding language? Ah, you put your finger on a really delicate spot. Um, so ImageJ and Fiji and also other tools are based on Java. And that was a great choice at the time. And now the whole deep learning world um, embraces Python very much. And Python is amazing for many, many reasons and disgusting for others. But it is the new thing. And it's very hard to find people that even are good Java programmers today. And it's everybody has some experience with Python. So 
this is exactly what I mean. See, now the world changed yeah. for some reason or another, and a lot of things we did are falling apart and and kind of outdated slowly. Which is kind of why I was asking the question of, yeah, you know, it, it's how do we migrate from from using to Java based into Python based? Because so much you you said so much exists in this 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 sphere of image Fiji under based under Java, but a lot of the new scientists, a lot of the new scripts coming are going to be coming up under Python, and they're not going to be that compatible. So. Yeah. Do you think a second Fiji redo BGP for Python will come through and they'll coexist and then slowly migrate as people patch things across or duplicate things across? Essentially, this is what has to happen. Yeah, we have to redo a lot of things, and it sounds horrible, but on the other hand, um, the scientific community also rolls over, right? You get older, you die. Young people come along, and and even if it would not have to roll over to a completely different programming language, the new people that come in have to relearn everything that exists. And so, relearning a lot of existing things is also not as much fun as creating something. So, maybe it's not as horrible that 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 things roll over and and renew themselves. And also, we have some lessons learned. Why is Fiji not only the most wonderful piece of software, but also horrible? Maybe we can kind of avoid some of these mistakes. And starting from scratch is not always bad, is what I want to say. It, it, but, but the problem is that it requires a lot, of, a lot of time and a lot of dedication. And so we need to give people that need to do this job the opportunity to be happy in their jobs. Yeah, because, you know, Image J, Fiji isn't just for my... It was built... Microscopy was very much a foundation, foundation to that, but all sorts in the world of science use it for all sorts of things from looking at their gel scans to their photography hobbies it, it's yeah. now used by so many different variety of people across the across the sciences and hobby right. as well it's, it's so yeah. cool. and so does python right yeah uh, python is used in many disciplines as well and and uh, napari is one of the very well funded developments in the recent years that i think has a good chance of and becoming indispensable for many of us. Is it replacing Fiji? One has to see. At the moment, it's not this like battery included many plugins. But, but I think some people in the Napari space um, see the future um, in that they're very close to kind of being a Fiji replacement in the Python world. You yeah, have to see. It's a bit early uh, to, to judge yeah. if it will, will be successful, but I think it has good, it has good potential. <laughs> So it's the evolution, but it's a big evolutionary step in this case, uh, which isn't always common. I'm going to ask you some quick fire questions. Uh, mm -hmm. So I hope you're ready for this. Are you uh, actually? Do you have any bad habits besides running for far too long? <laughs> oh, I'm sure, but I'm the really the wrong person to to be asked. Do a bad habits that I know about. I quit smoking a long time ago. Yeah, I think the running is maybe the worst of it. <laughs> okay. and, then, and then one could say that not, a, not being able to, to have a good work-life balance is maybe a bad habit. I'm not sure. I have to work on that too because I'm getting older. I noticed that I, I have to take it a bit easier maybe. I, yeah, but you said that your work is also your hobby. So I think the balance. It's true. The last two years were very stressful, though. I think it's also because of the move. A lot of things change, and, and you cannot only like run and do science, but you also have to take care of new insurances and all these like annoying things that come with being a human in our society. And maybe that stressed me out more. I think when this falls away, then maybe I can settle again into a homeostasis between long hours in the lab and running. Yeah. And you set up a new facility, a, a, a new lab and a facility within that lab space. And, you know, you've moved to country, you've moved to countries. So the bureaucracy will be different. And there's yeah. a lot of learning when you change institutes, even within the same country. There's so much ways of working. That I can imagine yeah. that's been a, quite a titanic learning curve uh, so early on as well. So I wouldn't worry about it. it it, it doesn't get easier, Florian. It will not get easier. Absolutely. Challenges. 
I just I just focus on the positives. Italy is an amazing country. Um, you can go in places that wherever you go, the coffee is like through the roof, exceptionally amazing. Mainly if you kind of compare to what I had in the past, the past ten years. Um, Twenty minutes by car, we are in in not in the Alps in Switzerland. We yeah. can do fantastic hikes, an hour and a half, and we are at the seaside. I think it's the potential to work life balance is phenomenal. <laughs> but then let's see how I do. <laughs> okay, more quick fire. Are you an early bird or night owl? I transition in growing older. Night owl, absolutely. I would have said until maybe two years ago. And mm -hmm. now I'm in a transition phase. I think I will very soon be old enough to stand up early and go to bed late. Yeah, welcome to the world. <laughs> How it should be. PC or Mac? Mac. Mac. McDonald's or Burger King? Burger King. Really? Yes. Mainly since they have different fries. The, uh, oh, no, it's the fries that let them down. Upper with cheese. <laughs> Insane. Uh, Enormous. Ah, uh, oh, juicy. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. Absolutely. Uh, coffee or tea? Coffee. Uh, beer or wine? Don't care. Flat prior. Whatever is available. Okay, Not so mixing it though. Alcohol, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Alcohol, yes. Absolutely. I'm a good friend of Pavel Tomanchak. I went to a very good school. <laughs> Chocolate or cheese? Mm. Chocolate. Okay. If, if, so, there you are at Woods Hole. There's going to be, there's bound to have been a tutor's dinner where everyone goes out. It'll be a nice place to eat. What would be the best food that's been selected for you to be put in front of you? What would be, you think that is just wonderful what's your favorite in, in Woodsville or in no just in general world? no matter where you know what it's like you're invited to talk you get taken out oh. and, then, and you get no choice of what to eat just put in front of you but what would be the perfect dish that they could put in front of you um a fiorentina okay you can also put it in other countries it's like a a, a, a t-bone steak with the filet and the counter filet on the other side. Ideally four, five centimeters tall and then brought to a very hot stone for like a few seconds on each side so that the, the inside is still essentially, yeah, only like warm, but not, oh my God, I start celebrating. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's my favorite food. And then uh, um, olive oil, salt, pepper, a bit of uh, rucola, or, yeah, sell it next to it. Best thing. There you go. For anyone who's thinking about inviting Florian to talk, you now know what you have to deliver. What is your nightmare, though? What would be the worst thing they could put in front of you? Oh, I would have many things to say as a kid. But now I'm very, I really like to experiment with food. I don't think... I, I don't think you can really fuck up. Okay. I, I would so nothing be that you would... Uh, go, oh. nothing, nothing that is nightmarish. I mean, uh, there's... Like fish that is fatty, like shark sometimes or so, is not the most, you know, but you I, can, I can... I guess you can enjoy it anyway. Yeah. Who cooks at home? You or your wife? Um... Very early, we noticed that we cannot cook together. We have to have a clear boss and like somebody that cuts and does like mm -hmm. no planning in the kitchen. And for a long time, we, we did it 50-50. And now I turned out to be more the morning person and I make elaborate breakfasts. And Gaia is usually more the evening cook. Okay. And next quick fire question, book or TV? I would really like to say book, but it would it would be a lie. TV. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with TV. So what what do you like to watch on TV? And uh, uh, what what shouldn't you admit to watching, but you secretly like? Okay, there's there's two things. Uh, I really like documentaries that are well well made. Um, but then sometimes when you are home, you just need to somehow cool your brain down to be able to sleep, and then it cannot be stupid enough. Uh, binge watching things is sometimes really fun 
I, I, I'm with you on that. And actually, I'm not totally with you on documentaries. Do you not find documentaries really slow and repetitive? Oh, it really depends. It really depends. Like, okay, let me find one that is really entertaining. Uh, search for Sugarman. Apartheid in South Africa. Um, there is one one album that is getting bootlegged and every household has it. But nobody knows who the artist is. And there's just like rumors. Then Apartheid ended. One of the kids grew older, is a documentary uh, filmmaker and, and looks for who this artist is and what is this real story. Wonderful music, really great like political backstory. It makes you very interested to kind of then look about look up apartheid on Wikipedia. But it, it's very entertaining at the same time. And it's a real life story, right? It's such a crazy story. A whole country doesn't know their favorite artist that kind of defined the generation. It's just insane. I like it. it. The reality of it is what gives the appeal. So thinking of favorite artists, what's your favorite music? Oh, that's also a really mean question. I sometimes say that I have no music taste because I, I like it I like so much. But I think it's not true because in every segment there is things I like and I don't like. So I must have some sort of taste. It's just very different. Coding <laughs> works really well, works really well with like metal, for example. No. Right? Now who was it who mentioned oh one of the other guests? actually mentioned someone who actually it is on computer driven music and i can't remember who i'm gonna to have to think about who that was put it on the uh, snippets at the end after this but then sometimes you can also code really well with like with like very monotonous electronic music but it has to be like a beat because at least when i code i get in this flow state where you really kind of you know sync fast and it kind of gives the pace of your thinking and love it and then for running i re listen a lot of music while running and there i like it much more melodic maybe guitars yeah uh, okay what's your favorite film um i will have to think a bit longer you have to cut it out at the end oh. my favorite film Florian. i really like i really like um oh, how was it called it was about a, um a student of music he's a drummer and there is a teacher that is very emotionally draining and brutal to him. Whiplash. Whiplash. Okay. So you like Whiplash? Um, the film. Whiplash. I like Whiplash. Whiplash, the film, is, is an amazing film because it makes a really complicated topic, the main topic, and that is how brutal can you be as a teacher and still... Yeah, I don't know. You have to watch the movie. I guess there's a reason why it's a 120 minute movie. It does not summarize well in, in 10 seconds, but it's a wonderful. So, yeah, I like it. I'm really disappointed that you didn't say ghost. Now, someone who's into pottery, surely it has to be the most famous pottery scene ever is in ghost. Ghost is OK, <laughs> but it, but every time I say that I that pottery is a hobby, people say, like, oh, ghost. <laughs> Everybody knows the scene, and yeah, it's totally not my favorite movie. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking forward to the parody that you do some point and forward it onto Twitter. Yourself and your wife just on a on your pottery stool. What's your we favorite do Christmas that. film? Do you have a favorite Christmas film? Um, uh, yeah, it's um, um, Die Hard. It must be Die Hard. Ah, good choice. Yeah, no, that's perfectly good. Now, you travel a lot with work, so going back to work, we, we, are, we are actually up to the, the hour, but I'm going to just indulge for just two more minutes. You travel you a lot also, around the world. You can, also cut out, you can also cut out a few of the boring things and keep it low an hour. People can fast forward, huh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you traveled all around the world teaching on courses. You're in Portugal, you're in the US at the moment. Uh, you've obviously done quite a lot of European countries. If you could live and work anywhere in the world, where would you take your lab as a location? At the moment, I wouldn't want to leave Milano. I think there is great potential. It's untapped and it would be premature to even kind of start thinking about going anywhere else. I think it will be a fantastic place. What about um, if you retire to? If you retired, where would you like to retire to? What would be your perfect location? Uh, I'm, I really like um, um, the area around UNC and North Carolina. Uh, Durham, 
Carboro. It's a beautiful. It's beautiful to run. Uh, people are also very friendly. I, I like it. And then the Bay Area has many downsides, but it's also extremely beautiful. So, have you um, been getting out running? What, what you been, uh, where have you been out running? Where you Woods Hole at the moment? Uh, yeah, here it's a bit. You have to run um, about ten k to go to to be in an area that offers trails. So I went only one time to to this trail area because you have at least half marathon ahead of you if you want to even reach and come back. Um, so it's a lot of road running along the sea. It's beautiful and Novska Beach, wonderful. And before I was actually visiting uh, the Bay Area, and there I did the trail run that was just so beautiful. I mean, you cannot. You can only fall in love with the with the scenery. It's, it's amazing. Great. We we are over the hour, but Florian, I'm going to be really cheeky and ask uh, the the microscopist. We're going to do a little subset of the microscopist in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope, which will be more subject based. And I know you're doing <laughs> a lot on the light and the EM restoration image side. Uh, it'd be great if we could get you back at some point to talk more about that work and the field of image analysis in that area. So will you come back and do that subset on the microscopist? 100%. Fantastic. Florian, thank you so much for joining me today. Everyone who's watched or listened, uh, I hope you've thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it's been enlightening to hear what Florian gets up to outside of work as well as work. We'll hear more about his work, hopefully in the future. But also, don't forget, you can go and listen to some of the people that Florian works and teaches with, such as Anne Carpenter, Ricardo Enriquez, uh, Paul Ryder, Mark Ray, actually, as well, uh, very much in this field area. Go and have a listen to those podcasts as well. Florian, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.